Hey, welcome to Scary Stories and Ambient Rain. This video is designed to help you sleep or relax. I really hope you enjoy. But before we begin, I want to give a huge update on what's been going on with Chilling, the horror app that I founded last year. You see right now, Chilling 2.0 is in development. What this means is, Chilling will soon evolve into a full-fledged platform. In addition to the scary stories, Chilling will also have video content. That's right, movies, shows, short horror films, and even Chilling originals. You'll also be able to interact with other users, narrators, authors, directors, like never before. As a user on Chilling, you can have a direct impact on the content we feature. You will actually have the ability to essentially vote on scary stories that you believe would make a great horror film or series, and if it gets enough votes, it will be adapted into a full-length film, a series, or a chilling original. This has never been done before, and we are excited to bring this to life. We are already partnered with distributors, and Chilling 2.0 will launch with at least 100 horror films, possibly much more. And we are already working with independent producers and directors to create quality-made, chilling originals. We are growing very fast, and recently we launched our campaign for people to invest and actually buy shares in the company. We have done nothing but grow since day one and I wanted to give my subscribers the opportunity to invest in Chilling before your typical investor. I know many of you support Chilling, and nobody deserves to own a piece of the company more than you. Chilling 2.0 is scheduled to launch in spring of 2023, so if you're interested in getting in on this, now is the time. I'll leave a link to the campaign in the description to this video. This platform was built by horror fans for horror fans. It was built for you. Lastly, as always, there are only three ads in this entire video after the first three stories. Then after that, no interruptions and it's smooth sailing. Now, let's begin. This is a night I'll always look back on and ask myself, what if I hadn't decided to do what I actually did? It was a night during the autumn season. I bring this up because it's important to know that it was dark out in the early parts of the evening. It's also important to note that the weather was cold enough to the point where we didn't have any windows or doors open in the house. So this night started off with my parents leaving to go to some dinner party a regular thing with them. They have a lot of friends and get invited to a lot of events. I was often left home alone, and I loved it. I loved the peace, the freedom to do as I pleased, and the freedom to eat what I pleased, when I pleased. The night started like any other night like this. I was enjoying the peace, watching TV, and at around 6 o'clock or so, I decided to make something to eat. I don't remember what I had. All I know is I didn't order anything because I know I didn't deal with any delivery people that night, and certainly wasn't expecting anyone to come to my house. So I'm just finishing up my food, throwing away my trash, and putting whatever silverware in the sink. Afterwards, I just randomly decided to look outside the window of my front door, which was closed and locked. I do that sort of thing often. Not for any particular reason. I just get curious. We live in a pretty safe neighborhood. Nothing ever really happens, and it's to the point where you hardly ever hear any sirens going off. Anyway, I just look outside from my front door that has a window on it so that you can see the outside before you open it. I wasn't expecting to see anything, and I wasn't doing this to investigate any kind of noise or anything. But when I look outside, I see a man walking up to my porch carrying something in each hand, in plastic grocery bags at his sides, and a running car in my street. I didn't really hear the car approach, and even if I did, 
I would just assume it was a neighbor's car running. But I am seeing what looks like a guy who's here to make some kind of delivery. And I didn't order anything. Especially not anything you would carry in plastic shopping bags. I also noticed that the running car in the street had a driver in it. While this guy was walking up my path to my porch. What kind of delivery requires two delivery guys? It only took a split second for me to see that this isn't a delivery where they have got the wrong address. My doors and windows were all locked, so I wasn't really worried just yet. Just cautiously curious as to what I'm currently seeing. So the guy walking up my path stops about three steps away from my porch and just stands there for a few seconds. It's dark out, and I can't really see his face. I know that it's a man from his height and build, but I can't identify anything distinctive about him. After standing still for a few seconds, he turns around and almost runs to the running car with a driver inside it and gets in the passenger side. I'm guessing he saw me look out my door and realized his cover and plan was blown before he could do anything. After watching him talk to the guy driving for maybe a minute, they take off down the street. It's now that the realization of this whole thing hits me hard. Clearly, they were robbers looking to break in, steal whatever valuables they could find, and get away as fast as possible. Why my house when it's smack dab in the middle of the street with plenty of neighbors as potential witnesses? Why my house when it's nothing fancy and looks no different from any other house around here? And what made them think no one would hear them attempting to break in with what I assume were tools in the bags that the man was carrying. I was honestly unsure what to do at this point. I knew calling my overprotective parents wouldn't help, not to mention I wouldn't feel safer if they came home or anything. I'm a fairly muscular guy, so I'm pretty confident I could defend myself if the need ever presented itself. I knew calling 911 would be a mistake. After all, they're gone. I don't feel in danger. I can't identify them, and even if I could, they technically didn't do anything illegal. Even though I'm fairly certain they weren't delivery guys, from the facts I mentioned earlier, I doubt a 911 operator would think otherwise. I decided to call my best friend and get his opinion. He believed my story and was rightfully concerned for me and skeptical of what I should do as well. It wasn't until after I told him the story that it occurred to me that we keep a non-emergency police line written on the side of our fridge, and I decided to call that. I thanked my friend and told him that I would update him later. We had this non-emergency police phone number written down after looking it up because there was a time where we needed the police, but not for an emergency. Even though this was a safe neighborhood and nothing ever really happened, there was a day where these two crazy guys were going door to door, asking for money. One of them wasn't wearing shoes, and the other guy said he needed money to buy his friend's shoes. My dad, who answered the door during this moment, slammed the door in their faces and watched them go to the other houses on our street. He looked up a non-emergency local police number and called it to report them. They arrived on our street without sirens, and found the two men going to houses asking for money and arrested them. So we kept this number on our fridge just in case we ever needed it again. And I needed it now. I spoke with a nice woman and told her what had just happened. She asked me a few questions like, what were they wearing? What kind of car were they driving? Etc. I explained that this all happened pretty quick and I wasn't paying much attention to those sort of things. Stupid, I know, but I was a little stunned in the moment from just happening to see a stranger come up to my door, carrying bags. I told her that I didn't think I'm in any danger, yet, and if anything else happened, I would call 911, but because I was worried that they may be trying to break into another nearby house, I asked her if there were any police patrolling the area, if they could just inspect my nearby streets, just in case. 
She gladly agreed and thanked me for calling this number and not 911, as she agreed that this wasn't an emergency. I just went back to sitting in front of the TV for the rest of the night. I couldn't focus on any show or movie after that. Too many racing thoughts and too many questions as well, as the fear of whether or not they will come back. My parents eventually came home and I told them the whole story. They were shocked and worried now too, but commended me for how I handled this. My dad agreed with my theory that the two men were watching houses, looking for ones they presumed were empty, and decided on ours since there was no car in the driveway and no one had exited it in several hours. But when the man walking up to our door saw my face looking out the door window, he panicked and decided to bail. I'd be lying if I told you there was tapping on our windows that night after we went to sleep. Nope. That was it. No further suspicious activities. No follow-up call from the police. Nothing. Nothing like this ever happened again, and it never made me feel uncomfortable to be alone ever again. But I often wonder, what would have happened if I didn't decide to look out my door when I did? Would I have had to fight off robbers? Did they have weapons just in case? I guess I'll never know. Before my brother had moved out of state, we would frequently go hiking together. One of our favorite spots was out by a river that was about 15 minutes from our house. By the time this took place, he had already moved, and I had not gone hiking. I don't normally hike by myself, but it had been a nice day, and I wanted to get some fresh air. For reference, I am a female, and I was around 19 at the time. The drive to the river was beautiful. I lived in the suburbs of my city, so it was not long before I passed the last of the houses and some businesses that were completely surrounded by vegetation that got thicker the closer that you got to the river. Once I got to the parking lot, I parked my car, got my backpack, locked my car doors, and started walking towards the river, which was just a short walk from the parking lot. The parking lot was fairly large for being a recreational area and could fit at least 50 vehicles, but there were only a few cars there that day. I passed the restroom building and some trash cans on my right and could see some campers by the river, a bit out towards my left. They had been at least 30 yards away from me. There is a walking trail that runs alongside the river that we would normally use that I was heading towards. Once I got closer to the river, I decided to turn right to start my hike instead of going left because I did not want to disrupt the campers. Soon after I started walking alongside the river, I heard a voice call out to me behind me, and I turned around to see who it was. It looked to be an older man, about late 40s to early 50s. He was walking up to me from the campsite and asked if I had a smoke. I had never really been a smoker, so I told him that I was sorry, and I did not. I glanced behind him and noticed that it looked like they had been more than just some campers. It looked like they had been living there. He said no worries. I gave a polite smile, turned back around, and continued on my hike. After going about 30 to 45 minutes, it had set in that I was hiking alone, and I suddenly no longer felt safe. I stopped to drink some water and also got my pocket knife out to hold in my hand in case I came across an animal or something. It had been getting a little warm, so I had taken my jacket off as well and held that over my arm, which had concealed the pocket knife. I backtracked almost to where I had started and noticed that the older man had started to walk towards me again and called out to me. I stopped to talk to him to see what he needed. To my surprise, he had asked me if I wanted to go hang out with them. I told him I couldn't and I had to get back home. I started to walk away and he had asked for my number 
and grabbed my tank top. I told him that I was sorry and I was not interested, and pulled away. He kept holding on to me, my tank top bunched up in his hand for a few more seconds. It felt like minutes, and it seemed like he had been considering something before letting me go. I was terrified, but had been glad that I had my pocket knife in my hand, in case he tried anything drastic. I speed walked back to my car, running once I was close enough. I had gotten in my car, immediately locked my doors, and got out of there as fast as I could. I don't know what would have happened if I stayed with them, or what that man's intentions were, but I have never hiked alone since. A few summers ago, I worked at a mall in Toledo, Ohio, a pretty big city nestled right up against the west end of Lake Erie. I was very concerned about money at the time, and I wanted to work as much as possible in order to save up for an apartment, my first major purchase. To do that, I took a job at the Great American Cookies Shop in the mall's food court, which had been around since before I was born, and to get some more bang for my buck, I worked there at night. For those who don't know, a lot of bakeries and coffee shops will often hire a baker to come in at dead of night in order to make all the pastries and treats for the morning. They'll come in around 3 a.m. and just bake for hours on end. That was exactly what I did. I pounded out cookie cakes and put cookies in the oven until the sun came up, and then I stayed even longer to make some more money. It was actually really cozy and relaxing, between the heat from the oven, the silence of the mall, and the freedom to blast my music or my podcasts. But it also put me on edge sometimes. It was haunted as heck, and nobody really knows why. One morning I was in the middle of eating breakfast at my counter, when I heard the carousel's sharp music echoing through the massive food court. To set the scene, our food court has this little play area on the opposite side from where I work. It's got all these kitty rides that light up and play music, and they're all motion activated, so they light up when people walk by. Normally I wouldn't give the sound a second thought, but I knew for a fact that there wasn't supposed to be anybody else in the mall at this hour, and there's no way that I could have activated the ride sensor myself. As a person who regularly listened to scary stories while at work, I was immediately excited and anxious to see what might have happened. I turned on the oven and shut off the lights to every area but my workstation in order to tune in to the other end of the dark food court. It was nearly pitch black beyond the dim lights above my workstation, but I could see that the only thing out of place was that carousel which was now spinning just enough for its creaking and scraping to find a rhythm. It wasn't until a second ride activated that I saw what really set it off. Illuminated by the headlights of one of the race car themed rides, it was clear to me that there was something standing behind the carousel, something that was now facing my direction. The very defined silhouette of a security guard leaning around the central pillar of the ride. I had been standing and leaning around the corner of a doorway, essentially mirroring it, trying to keep hidden enough to watch uninterrupted. I did that until I started to feel uncomfortable with what I was looking at. If they are standing on a carousel, why aren't they spinning? If they are a security guard, why aren't they doing their rounds like they do during the day? Why were they trying to sneak around in the first place? I kept my eyes glued on the opposite end of the food court as I texted one of the security guards I knew. They confirmed my suspicions. I was the only person scheduled to be in the mall. I glanced down at my phone to reread the text. It maybe took a second. The moment I felt my gaze drop, I stopped myself but it was already too late. There was now something standing about five feet away from our counter, 
right along the edge of my field of view. Fun fact about the counter of our shop. It's not tall. I, standing at 6'4", could essentially step over it, and my comically short sister who worked the day shift told me that she sometimes just leapt over the counter after closing up shop. I was now essentially standing in an island with only one route of escape if this creep decided to jump the counter. I took the opportunity while I had it and left the shop. It didn't end there, though. My car was parked pretty far away, so I instead decided to run along the long service hall towards our stock room. It was the only other door in the mall that I could lock and unlock, so I pushed my back against the door and locked the deadbolt behind me. Feeling better behind a locked door, I sat there, watching YouTube under the blindingly bright ceiling lights. I felt secure and safe in that room, right up until I heard footsteps coming slowly down the hallway. They were slow and light, like a kid tiptoeing down their stairs on Christmas. It was almost playful. I held my breath and waited for the footsteps to pass by my door. It was like they stopped just before it and started to walk in place, as if it knew where I was but couldn't get to me. It was then that I heard these clicking and flickering sounds, some mix between the sound of keys jingling and lights popping on and off. Whatever was outside that door, it was just having its fun scaring me. I'm sure a lot of people have had a nightmare where they were running away from a threat that always knew exactly where their prey was. It felt like that, but I knew this was real. Luckily, I also knew I was safe, and at one point or another, I realized that the footsteps were gone. It wasn't until after I told the story to my coworkers later that I realized I never had to reopen the deadbolt to exit that stock room. It was already unlocked. When I was about 10 or 11, I lived in a duplex house with my parents in Tennessee. It was a pretty good size. Three bedrooms, huge backyard, and a good-sized porch in front of my house. I was in a decent school and had many friends on that block. Plenty of good times were had, and pleasant memories made. However, there is one memory that isn't pleasant at all, and it happened in that house. I always had a strange feeling in that house. That feeling you get when you think someone is watching you, but you are by yourself. That sort of feeling. I always felt like someone or something was watching me from inside my closet, in particular. But being a very self-aware person my whole life, I figured that was just normal kid fears. Something in the closet, something under the bed, etc. But what I couldn't explain was our lights would turn on and off by themselves a lot. And the TV would turn on and off a lot. My father tried explaining it, that it was the electricity or the house wiring, and it didn't seem to bother my parents. One day after school, I got home and started the regular routine. I got a snack, turned on Nickelodeon, and started doing homework in front of the TV on the floor. About ten or so minutes into it, I heard something coming from my parents' bedroom, like a rustling. I knew my parents weren't home from work yet. It was still pretty early in the afternoon, and their cars weren't in the driveway. For all I knew, it could have been an intruder, and I was a skinny little boy at the time. Instead of getting a neighbor, I started walking toward the bedroom. I then noticed the rustling noise was coming from their bedroom. They had the master bedroom, of course, and I found that odd. What was happening in the bathroom? Like, if it was a robber, why would they be in the bathroom? I get to the bedroom door, which was open, but before I step in, I said, Mom, Dad, is that you? I knew it couldn't be them, but that's just what came out. Then it happened. I heard what sounded like a cackle, 
like a rotten snicker, and then what I can only describe as an old hag's voice. It repeated back my words, only in a mocking fashion. Mom? Dad? Is that you? Then it cackled again. At this point, I think I'm dreaming and tears start to well up in my eyes. I figured I was about to get jump-scared or shocked, so I walked toward the bathroom, thinking I would wake up at the jolt. I got to the bathroom and I saw... Nothing. Nothing but a bunch of bathroom items knocked on the floor and into the sink. I turned and started to run out, and I tripped on the doorway and fell on my chest. Now I really think I'm dreaming and I start crying, calling for my mom. That kind of thing. It felt like I was on the floor for an hour, but it was probably not even one minute. I got up, looked behind me once more, still see nothing, and ran to the living room to get my homework and went outside on the porch, not going back inside until whatever parent got home first. When I told them, they chalked it up to being a dream, that I probably dozed off watching TV and just had a vivid dream. All right, but the thing is, I don't remember waking up that day. The day just went on, into the evening, and then into the night where I probably didn't get much sleep then. Nothing to that magnitude happened to me in that house after, and we ended up moving a year or so later. I'm older now, but still to this day, I am uneasy being in bathrooms, because if I ever heard that voice again... I don't know what I would do. I would probably have a heart attack. The voice was that nasty. I hated that house. One Fourth of July weekend in 2011, a buddy of mine that I'll refer to as Todd ended up in a pretty precarious situation. What follows is the story that he told me. It was supposed to be a fun weekend up the hill and in the woods at Todd's friend Troy's cabin. Troy was to introduce Todd to a girl he also invited over. So naturally, Todd was looking forward to some devious fun for the holiday weekend. As luck had it, Todd and his new date clicked and soon found themselves downstairs for some alone time. Shortly after Todd and his date disappeared downstairs, Troy decided to go out for a little while. A little while later, as Todd and his date were getting into it, Troy returned to his cabin with some company. Upon hearing foreign voices upstairs, Todd went upstairs to see who was there. To Todd's dismay, he found that Troy had brought home someone that he disliked a guy named Ace for the sake of this story. Seeing Ace, Todd got angry and an argument ensued between Todd and Troy while poor Ace stood awkwardly near the doorway. Cue Troy's girlfriend entering only to stand next to Ace with a bewildered expression on her face. Todd had rushed upstairs in his boxers at first, thinking that it was just guys that had arrived initially, so he and Troy quickly went downstairs to argue further. As Todd and Troy's argument diminished, Troy decided that he, his girlfriend, and Ace would go night swimming at a nearby creek for a while to cool off. For whatever reason, Troy threw on Todd's shorts to swim in, in which had Todd's keys, wallet, and smokes in the pockets. Troy and his company had already been gone for a few minutes before Todd realized what had happened. So, Todd and his date continued on downstairs until Troy, Ace, and Troy's girlfriend returned to the cabin. Right as Todd heard them returning, though, he went upstairs to confront Troy, fuming. Todd demanded his shorts back while yelling about his stuff in the pockets during Troy's swim. As the two argued back and forth for a while, Troy's girlfriend, Todd's date, and Ace tried to pretty much blend with the wallpaper. As Todd demanded that Troy take his shorts off then and there, Troy informed him that he would not be stripping down in front of everyone. 
That was when Ace cut in to have Troy's back, making the argument even worse. But Ace knew that Todd had quite a reputation for fighting and not losing. So in order to sort of prove himself to Troy, he jumped right into that argument. After a little more arguing, Troy and his girlfriend left again in Todd's shorts. Ace stayed behind, though, for some reason. Maybe because Troy had left without his backpack full of his personal and important items. Eventually, Todd and his date went back downstairs to go back at it. Ace, of course, stayed upstairs and kept company with Todd's pit bull. They all expected Troy and his girlfriend to return that night, at least for his backpack. But when everyone woke up the next morning, they realized that Troy and his girlfriend had not returned to the cabin. Everyone was puzzled as to what Troy was up to. But since Troy had left his cell phone in his backpack, they all just hung around the cabin and waited for Troy. The second night came and went with no word from Troy or his girlfriend. It wasn't until they got up on the third day with still no Troy that they finally really started to worry. Alarm bells were definitely going off for the trio. Todd decided to try and call Troy's girlfriend again, like he had the previous day when her phone seemed to be switched off. That day it finally rang and she picked up. Fear crept into her voice when she realized that Troy wasn't back at the cabin like she assumed he would have been. So her and Todd agreed to start calling around to see if they could track down Troy. But no one had heard from Troy at all. Next, a panicking Todd called a few friends up to the isolated cabin to help search the nearby woods for Troy. Not a single trace of Troy was found. It was Todd who made the decision to call Troy's girlfriend and have her report Troy missing. She did just that, but when asked of Troy's last known whereabouts, she gave them the honest answer. She told them that Troy was last seen at his cabin having a heated argument with Todd. The problem with that was that Todd had a pretty well-known reputation for fighting. At this point in which the following events took place, Troy had been missing for three days, so he was declared lost at that point. Apparently, the cops decided they should take it seriously. The following morning, Todd, his date, and Ace were fast asleep, only to be startled awake to the sounds of both the front door being kicked in and people running around, seemingly on the roof. The SWAT team flooded in, subduing the trio inside. At one point, one of the SWAT officers said, I will kill you and I will kill the dog. Upon hearing that, Ace suddenly popped his face up from the floor and exclaimed, Why would you do that? Of course, the dog did not get hurt at all. What came next was the trio getting questioned by a couple of detectives portraying in the usual good cop, bad cop scenario. Unfortunately for Todd, though, he was the last person seen with Troy and they were arguing. Couple that with Todd's reputation for fighting, and well, that made Todd the number one and only suspect in Troy's disappearance. It also didn't help that the detectives had found some clothing left by the hot tub, and some of the clothing had drops of blood on it, though Todd insisted that he didn't even know whose clothes they were. Search and rescue came in next to comb the surrounding woods for clues to Troy's whereabouts. They searched for hours while Todd, Ace, and Todd's date were still being questioned, but they focused mainly on Todd. After a couple of hours of interrogation, Todd finally got irritated and insisted that since Troy had been missing for three days at that point, he could either be dead or alive, but they should be focusing their efforts on finding Troy. Oblivious to Todd and company was the fact that Search and Rescue had located Troy, deep in the woods and hours away from his cabin. Troy was found passed out on a large rock, naked and just hours away from his demise. The next thing that Todd, his date, Ace, and the detectives heard was the sound of the Search and Rescue helicopter's chopper blades cutting through the air and getting closer to the cabin. As they peered out the door, 
They saw the approaching chopper with Troy suspended in a blue diaper-like thing from it. The chopper was looking for a safe place to lower Troy enough for emergency ground personnel to be able to reach him. As the smoke was still clearing on the whole situation a couple of days later, Todd was informed about the facts that led up to Troy's disappearance. Apparently, Troy and his girlfriend left the cabin on the night he vanished to simply cool off after the argument with a nice walk in the woods that surrounded the cabin. But right after they had left for the walk, Troy's girlfriend had stolen his debit card. Shortly after setting out on their walk, Troy and his girlfriend got into an argument themselves. They got separated after that, and Troy's girlfriend ended up walking herself back to the main road, where she had called a ride, leaving Troy in the woods and assuming that he would find his way back to the cabin. So basically, Troy's girlfriend turned her phone off for the next couple of days in order to avoid Troy's angry phone calls about his debit card while she partied the whole time. When she did finally turn her phone back on, she received Todd's concerned call about Troy. She was shocked to learn that Troy had been missing for the last couple of days. Troy ended up being relatively okay, considering the circumstances. Todd ended up moving out of state shortly after, which pretty much dissolved the friendship. As far as Ace, Todd's date and Troy's girlfriend. Well, they're in the wind, I guess you could say. I'm almost positive, though, that none of the people involved in this story will ever be able to forget about the events that took place over those fateful three days at the cabin. I have started taking a supplement known as Lion's Mane over the past few months. It's supposed to help with brain function and improve memory. I'm pleasantly surprised by how well it's been working for me, because lately I've been remembering a lot of events from my early childhood when I was around four to six years old with a surprising amount of detail. A lot of them are good memories, but one in particular stands out to me. When I was younger, my parents would always take the whole family out to a small town in Colorado to go on vacation. We loved the atmosphere of small towns and wide open mountain ranges, and this place was our regular travel spot. Now, when I say small, I mean that this town is home to about 300 people. It got its start as a mining town in the late 1800s, and the families of those miners generally stuck around, and their descendants still inhabit the town to this day. Everybody knows everybody in this town, and people knew my family because we were regular visitors and we owned a few acres of land on the edge of the town. I can recall one vacation in particular. It was around the start of winter, so my parents had taken my brother and I there on one of our school breaks. My grandparents came to join us and I remember having a great time going on walks with the whole family and playing with the new toys my grandparents had gotten me. One of the toys they got me was a little remote control ATV with a toy man sitting on top of it wearing a helmet and a biker jacket. I think that toy is the reason this memory stands out to me, for reasons that you will soon understand. On that vacation we took a walk around the less populated parts of town. Because this was a town that seemed to come up out of nowhere in the middle of the mountains, there were plenty of walking trails and scenic routes to explore and I would always take walks with my family when we visited. One of our favorite routes included a bridge that overlooked a steep valley, and the scenery looking off that bridge was absolutely beautiful. When we got to that point in the walk where we approached the bridge, there was a man sitting there, with his back rested against the guardrails of the bridge. Now, remember that toy I mentioned earlier? This man was also wearing a helmet and a biker jacket, just like my toy. I remember thinking this was really cool, and I said something to him like, You look just like my toy. Immediately, my mom said something to the effect of, Oh, honey, don't bother that man. He's tired and needs to rest. 
I didn't think much of that because I was a very over-talkative kid, and I was used to my parents telling me not to bother strangers. My dad chimed in, saying something about how he knows this guy and how he was going to stop and talk to him for a bit. He told us that we should all go on ahead with the walk and that he would catch up to us later after he was done talking to the guy. I didn't think much of this either, because like I said, everybody knows everybody in this small town. My mom grabbed both me and my brother by the hand and practically dragged us past the man and onto the rest of the walk. This is the point where I thought something felt weird, because it seemed like my mom was in a hurry for no reason. I asked her who that man was, and my mom just told me that it was a friend of my dad's, and that he'll be back later. I put the whole thing out of my mind quickly and enjoyed the rest of our walk. Only when my dad met back up with us at the cabin we were staying in, did I think about it again, and I asked my dad who the man was. He told me something about how it was just an old friend who lived here, and we never talked about it again after that. Here we are now, nearly two decades later, and this memory pops into my mind today when I see a kid in my apartment complex playing with a similar toy to the one that my grandparents had gotten me. I remembered those nice vacations and how much I enjoyed looking off into the vast space of the mountains and valleys. I remembered playing with that toy ATV in the backyard of that vacation cabin, showing my grandparents all of the cool tricks I could do with it. And I remembered that man sitting on the bridge and how my mom was in such a hurry to get on with the walk while my dad stayed behind to talk to the guy. Suddenly, that memory didn't quite feel right. Something was off. I kept thinking about it through the rest of this morning, wondering why my mom was so insistent that we move on. Wondering how my dad could have possibly recognized the man when his head and face were completely covered by a helmet. I texted my dad, asking him, Do you remember that time we were on vacation in Colorado and you ran into one of your friends sitting on a bridge that we were walking on? It suddenly popped into my head and I remember it being kind of a weird situation. What happened there? At this point, I was pretty sure I already knew the answer to that question. I just got off the phone with my dad about an hour ago. He called me after seeing my text. He said he didn't think that I would even remember that happening, but that he thinks about it all the time and that he often worried about whether my brother and I understood what was going on in that moment. He explained the entire thing to me, and my suspicions were confirmed. While we were taking one of our usual walks, we came up to a bridge, and my parents saw that man sitting there leaning against the bridge. Or, to put it more accurately, that man's body. My parents were alarmed when I immediately tried to talk to the body about my new toy, so my dad quickly came up with the idea to say that he knows the guy and that he would meet us later because he wanted to talk to the man. In reality, he had never met the man before in his life. He just wanted to check to see if the man still had a pulse and call 911 about the situation. This next part is what made my dad feel extremely uncomfortable and still makes him feel queasy thinking about it today. He didn't want my brother and I to understand what was actually going on, so in order to conceal the fact that this man was probably no longer alive, he sat down next to the body and started talking to it. He had to sit right next to this man's body and carry on a one-sided conversation with it until we were out of earshot. At that point, he checked the man's pulse and confirmed what he already knew. That resting biker would be resting forever. This was before cell phones were very common, and even then, there would have been no way to get a signal in an isolated town like this. He ran back to town, called the county sheriff from a landline, and ran back to the bridge to wait for them to arrive. While my dad was waiting there, he looked around to try to figure out what happened, and it wasn't hard to tell. The bridge had started to get icy because it was the start of winter, and this man must have been taking the curve onto the bridge a little too quickly. 
My dad looked over the edge of the bridge, and sure enough, there was a motorcycle at the bottom of the valley. The man had crashed, probably been injured very badly, and had propped himself up hoping that help would arrive. My family did come across him, but not soon enough. Looking back on it, we never took that walking path again in all the times we vacationed there in the future. I think my dad wanted to avoid it, both because the memory of having to talk to a body and pretend it was alive made him feel sick, and because he didn't want my brother and I remembering the situation and figuring out what actually happened. In high school, I worked as a junior electrician at a large theme park. There were maybe eight or ten senior electricians above me. We fixed and maintained the electrical components of the roller coasters and other rides. One particular senior electrician, Frank, was my boss, and my job was to assist him in whatever he was doing. I started off following him around, handing him tools as needed. Then I gradually learned the ropes. He would send me across the park on my own to fix whichever ride happened to have an issue. I worked at this park for three summers, so I got to know Frank pretty well. He was in his early fifties, rather slim, and had a thin, neatly trimmed mustache. He was also as straight-laced as they come. Super religious. Wouldn't even work on Sundays also vehemently against drugs and alcohol. Anyway, one day the third summer I worked there, I showed up to the park as usual to start my shift. I reported to the electrician station, where Frank was already busy doing paperwork. He said hello, and then instructed me to take my toolbox across the park to the kitty station, where a certain ride needed fixing. I gathered my stuff and had just started to leave, when Frank called my name. I turned around thinking he had forgotten to tell me a detail about the ride or something like that. He looked me dead in the eyes, and I was immediately taken aback by his expression. It was blank and emotionless, nothing like his normal demeanor. Something was off. Yeah, Frank? I answered. What he said next is permanently etched in my memory because of the sheer bizarreness of it. While maintaining eye contact with this same dull, emotionless expression, he spoke very clearly in a monotone voice quite different from his normal speech. The Space Indians are coming, he said. I stared at him for a few seconds, puzzled and unsure how to respond. He kept looking at me for a moment, then seemed to snap out of it, turning around and going back to his paperwork. What's that? I asked, pretending I had misheard him. Frank ignored the question, telling me without turning around, now in his normal voice, to hurry up and get the kitty ride fixed. I obeyed, but kept thinking about the weirdness of the incident for the rest of the day. I had no idea who or what these space Indians were, and the look in Frank's eyes when he said it was deeply unsettling. Eventually I forgot about the incident, and the next few weeks of work were uneventful. Then, one day near the end of summer, it all came rushing back. I arrived at the park one morning in late August, and Frank was standing in the parking lot, alone between the rows of vehicles, looking up at the sky. The fact that he was standing there immediately caught my attention as I climbed out of my car because he had gotten to the electrician station before me every morning for all three summers that I had worked there. He was extremely punctual. Now suddenly he's standing there, late for work, staring at the sky. I walked up to him and said something casual, probably, morning Frank, or something like that. He slowly shifted his gaze from the sky and looked me dead in the eye, my head started spinning as I realized he was staring at me with the same blank expression he had weeks earlier when he said the weird thing about space Indians. 
We looked at each other for a few seconds. Then he spoke in that same monotone voice as before, very different from his normal speech. He said, The Space Indians are here now. It's too bad. Then he suddenly turned on his heels and walked away. Walked right out of the parking lot. I asked where he was going, but he didn't respond. He turned out of the parking lot onto a small side street and disappeared. I never saw or heard from him again. A week later, I was assigned to work with a new senior electrician. I asked him what happened to Frank, but he acted like he didn't know who I meant. I even asked the main boss of the hiring department. He told me no one by Frank's name had ever worked there. I am baffled by the whole thing to this day. This experience happened to my wife. She doesn't know I'm telling this, so please don't tell her. I just think and hope that someone out there had a similar experience. It's too uncanny for just my wife to see. Please message me wherever you find this. Comments, DMs, I don't care. She needs help. Soon. Being a fan of the paranormal since I was basically just out of diapers, I live for the scary, strange, and dark. I'll put this here right now though. I do not believe in anything paranormal. I have never seen anything or heard anything that I could not explain. I love the feeling of being scared and the talent of writers and filmmakers for making scary things come to life. That being said, when I met my future wife almost 20 years ago, she told me this experience she had that still sticks with her. And over the next two decades, she has never changed the story when it has come up. I met my beautiful wife at an engagement party. I honestly don't even remember who it was for because I've lost touch and I'm pretty sure they are not together anymore. I do know that I was brought by a friend of a friend and my future wife was a friend of the bride-to-be. I had been eyeing her all night, striking in her green dress, totally complimenting her auburn hair and hazel eyes with a side of envy. She made her way to the bar and I finally worked the nerve up to talk to her. That's all I wanted, just to talk, get in, even if it didn't lead to anything. I just had to be around her for the moment. Thankfully, she dismissed my diarrhea of the mouth when I tried to just say hello. The rest is kind of history, as they say. But during that first conversation, when I finally felt comfortable and knew she was kind of into me, too, I asked one of my standard questions to anyone I just met. What's the scariest thing you've ever seen in your life? It's an open question, and could be taken a few ways. Scary as in near-death experience, scary as in seeing someone get hit by a speeding vehicle, or scary as in seeing something unexplainable. I've already explained that I'm into freaky spooky stuff. I'll take any answer, but I always hope for the scary option. I've seen two witches in my mirror as a child, and they still follow me. She spoke this to me with the seriousness of Daniel Day freaking Lewis carrying out a pivotal scene. Most people I ask this question of try to negate their scary experience, but not her. She was almost ready to tell someone about this. I was enamored just watching her talk. Her beauty and grace washed over me like a warm August night. But when the details of her story started to pierce through my schoolboy-like crush, I started to sober up. She told me that when she turned about 13, she started to get into Wiccan stuff. That movie, The Craft, had just came out. Man, if you weren't around, you don't get how much that influenced the female community. She and her friends read the Wiccan stuff, made recipes, quote-unquote, and spells, and watched the craft continuously. One night, going to bed, she sees something in the corner of her mirror. 
She has one of those large wardrobes handed down from a great-grandmother. A mirror sat on top of maybe six drawers, three on either side. The right corner starts to glow ever so lightly. It's gray, just enough to notice if you were looking right at it. I shiver as I think of a 13-year-old Billy. That's what everyone called her. Her real name is Margaret. Still don't know the story. Staring at her mirror, watching these two specters come to life in front of her eyes. As I've said, I don't subscribe to the actual thought of paranormal experiences, but hers stuck with me. Not because we are married now. I had no idea we would be at the time. She described the faces in such detail, such horrifying detail, and I watched her face as she did. It changed into pure horror. So many years later, the horror has subsided, but whenever it comes up, she still has that hint of terror. To this day, years later and married for almost 12 years, she has never changed the story of what she saw. What puts this over the edge for me is that for a brief time when we were just engaged, her father let us live in his home, the same home where she grew up in, the same home she saw the witches, as she called them, the home that still contained that mirror dresser. I won't admit I have seen or felt anything like she did, but I do look into that mirror, and I do not like the feeling that I get. There are a lot of stories I could tell about the house I grew up in. I was eight when we moved into the house in Lawrenceville, Georgia, and I lived there for about five years in between 2003 and 2008. It sounds very cliche to say that there was something off about the house, but there was. I didn't have anything to compare it to at the time, really. I had an overactive imagination and practically watched whatever horror movie I could find, so it was easy for me to say that it was all in my head back then. But looking back, I have never lived somewhere that could consistently raise the hair on the back of my neck like certain rooms in that house did. I used to leap across the doorway to the bathroom because I was afraid there would be someone in there when I walked by. I would always close the door to my sister's room at the end of the hall, because even after she moved out, it somehow still never felt empty, and no one went in the basement alone, which is where the first unexplained thing happened in this house. About two months after we moved in, our parents were at work on a summer day, and it was just me and my sister. I'm playing original Sly Cooper on PS2 in my room when my sister barges in with our dog, grabs my baseball bat, and swiftly states, We need to get out of the house with a look in her eyes that made clear this wasn't a joke. Our neighbors down the road was an old church friend and used to be a cop in New York, and we were told to go there if anything ever happened. My sister and I marched over to their house, and she told them that there was someone in our house. But as we got further from the house, I think there was a level of uncertainty that built inside her as to what just happened. Our ex-cop neighbor probably felt that uncertainty and thought he better check the house himself instead of calling the police outright. He found nothing. When he came back to ask her what had happened, this was her story. She noticed our small dog, Max, was standing at the top of the basement stairs, barking into the darkness with his tail between his legs. She then followed him to the bottom of the steps to see what he was barking at, as this seemed unusual for him. He was then peering around the wall at the bottom of the steps towards the storage room, whimpering. She picked him up and peered around the wall to see what had him stirred. And to this day, she still maintains the same story of a man standing in the dark corner a few feet in front of her with a grin. He put a finger to his lips and whispered,
Not every town is lucky enough to have a placid bay just beyond its downtown strip. Most aren't fortunate enough to have residents that all know one another, who move with unity to run the town like it's a fifth grade baseball game that keeps parents up until 11 p.m. The dream of a happier life rings through every church bell and backyard radio in this little town, though a town where the bright green grass is cut in organized lines and the little shops along the beach all have sand gathered on their doormats. The cascading spray of the sea constantly glides across everything it can reach, covering the town of dreams in a salty fog, leaving only faded footprints and ripple marks behind. I was told that any moment of that town could be captured in a photograph and put on a billboard for the world to see how happy life was there. And nothing captures that better than the footprints that are left on the beach every morning. A father and a daughter, knowing that they will be able to race the sunrise to the water if they leave early enough, rush to the docks as they always do. There isn't even breakfast in their stomachs, but they are too full of excitement to eat any more anyways. And so, they start their journey. After a brief sprint down the wide residential street and along the sturdy wooden dock beyond it, the daughter finally wins her race against the light. As it cracks its glowing light through the rolling waves, the father and daughter walk, their closely aligned footprints telling the world about their love. The bigger shoes take the side closest to the waters, as always, and the footprints of his little girl take more than one detour in a useless attempt to pursue some distraction. Those footprints are their story and they tell it every day. One day, though, their story changed. It was one of the few days that I didn't work the graveyard shift at the fire station the night before, a rare moment where I let the sun win its race against me. Those two adventurous souls didn't let that happen, though, and they went out as they always did on a windy morning. But just after they departed from the dock and made their first imprints on the sand... The footprints veered off and walked into the ocean, without a single break in the pattern. It was an act as confident as the crashing of the waves, one with no fear or even any knowledge of another way of existing. And after those waves receded, only one set of footprints returned. The father, the man who saw two stars ahead of him when he lost that race to the beach, had thrown his daughter to the sea like she was a backpack that was hurting his shoulders. It was almost like the waves had been writhing that day in a hopeful attempt to give her back, but not even the power of the deep could return a resident that was sent there too soon. As I sit on a bench overlooking the docks below, I bring a steaming cup of coffee up to my dry mouth, desperately craving the energy to fully open my eyes. The warmth of the mug in my hands forces that dreadful wind away. This town has never had so many windy mornings this consistently, and the wind has never been so loud. It drowns out my desire to do anything but look out at the beach. The footprint-covered beach. And the man walking across it. My body freezes solid as I pour all of my strength into tracking the figure with my eyes. He's blacker than the moon-kissed sand of the beach, and the murky moonlight offers nearly no help in making out anything, more than a tall and shadowy outline. There's something incomplete about it, as if I'll be able to see right through it if I decide to walk closer to it. His walk seems unfinished, too. It's slower than it should be, and his feet trudge beneath him as if the sand he steps on is as wet as the ocean floor. He looks like the subject of an old and faded photograph, one crushed under the weight of an entire shelf of albums and papers. I start to feel that same crushing force he seems to feel as I continue to stare at him. The entire weight of the world seems to want to fall onto my shoulders until I fall through the stone terrace that's holding me up. But it's not the world bearing down on me. It's my own body shutting down. 
drowsiness almost overtakes me, and I clumsily splash my last sips of hot coffee all over my face to keep myself from falling. But it doesn't work. In that moment of pain and alertness and fear, I finally feel the figure's attention land on me. And seconds later, I feel the cold stone catch my fall. One month later, it took a while for me to visit the beach again. Town lit up with a series of reports of missing children, almost two per week. Nothing is ever supposed to happen in this town. After one death pushed its way in, more found the fracture in our sense of safety and immediately rushed in. Everybody thought it was somehow all connected, but nothing ever actually proved that until one of the bodies washed back up on the beach. The only thing that could have done that was a storm or an unheard of wonder of nature. And we don't get storms around here. I'm glad I was sitting at the beach that day. Work took up most of the last few weeks, and pure dread kept me from using my little free time to take the walk to my usual morning spot. As I finally walk up in this still moment, the first thing I notice is the breeze. It's nothing like the howling wind that still rages through my memory. Finding new confidence, I finish the walk and end up all the way on the beach proper. There, I notice the footprints. Or, I suppose I should say footprint. The sand is only covered by a single line of marks, as if only one shoe had been planted in the sand by a person who was hopping along the beach earlier in the morning. But people who hop don't drag their feet, and there's something about these footprints that don't sit well with me. They leave torturous, drawn-out marks in the disturbed sand, and they shift and shake with the unsteadiness of a dust storm. I follow the prints with my eyes, right up to the figure standing only a few dozen yards away from me. What faces me is half of the shape of a man, and the other half dissolving into a mist of sand and floating gently into the ocean. The solid half, the part of him that isn't standing over moving water, looks coarse and damaged by time. He is standing more still than any human ever could, stiller than the pictures of this very beach that I have hanging in my house. I know right away what I'm staring at. There is only one man that I've ever seen make his mark on this beach at this early hour. The man that took his daughter there to find happiness. The same man that took his daughter there to meet her final moments. We never truly know what other people hide from the world. Afraid that the parts of themselves that they find in dreams will make themselves real. We sleep at dead of night to keep that sinister spirit at bay. Giving it only the briefest glimpses of a fabricated life that is freed from any morality. Nothing is more terrifying than that version of ourselves. The one that exists only to disagree with the world. Inside of that father was a darker half. A second piece of his being that was forced to become part of the earth as his better half searched for his daughter in the sea. Now, that is the only part of him that is left to make footprints in the sand that has so relentlessly taken him. I watch as he walks his path, the pure evil making its way along the beach as his older, kinder soul fades away from that horrible frame, desperate to escape to a place where his daughter can finally rest, as if he knows I am making the horrific realization of what I'm looking at. The dark figure turns to face me, his thin frame twisting and warping like a broken branch caught in a hurricane. He then begins to take those dreadful steps towards me. With every footprint he leaves, another maddening thought crashes its way into my mind. I think about the sensation of my fear doubling down on me. I think about the plight of this man's poor daughter. I think about all the people that never had any idea that the mourning man in front of me 
had kept this true monster hidden from the entire world, without a single trace to be seen. I think about the heart-sinking feeling of powerlessness that I imagine the daughter felt in the moment she felt herself submit to her horrible father. Drowsiness invades my mind, as if I can't even stay lucid long enough to come to terms with a world that allows such evil to overcome all those things that are good and pure. It isn't a world I want to exist in. That father shouldn't be able to outlive his daughter, and I don't want to watch him leave those lonely footprints in the sand every morning, the manifesto of his deceptions. I let the soft feeling of dread wash over me, and it doesn't take long for the waves to wash over me too. To my brother, I'm sure I'm just another victim of his fading soul. This, perhaps, is one of the most interesting things to ever happen to me in my 36 years in this realm. I have perhaps encountered a Sasquatch, or a freaky bear, or perhaps had an experience with extraterrestrials, and I've definitely met some very strange, creepy people in Northern California. This experience, however, is just an experience I have no idea how to explain, nor do I know what to think nor do I ever want to think about it, ever, ever again. However, I feel as if I have to get this one off my chest, because it is weird, and oftentimes I have very strange dreams that are involved around it, and it makes me believe, subconsciously I suppose, that I have never dealt with the possible trauma from what had happened. I was born and raised in New Mexico, and ended up moving to California with my father throughout the rest of my life, with the exception of some stints here and there due to jobs and whatnot. Normally I avoid New Mexico like the plague. It is a haunted, godforsaken, rattlesnake-infested hellhole. My mother and my sister, however, just refuse to leave the desolate wasteland, and so oftentimes I have to go down there and visit, especially when my mother got cancer. She's fine now, though. She had a tumor on her parathyroid, and it was removed, thankfully. So, the backstory is over. Onward with the actuality of what had happened. I was driving my piece-of-crap Honda down the highway when it just ran out of gas. I found that odd because when I had started the car, and initially I still had a quarter of a tank, but such is, I guess. It just sort of sputtered out in the middle of the highway, around the end of the road of the reservation. I knew that there was a gas station about a mile away, once I managed to get out onto the highway. So, I took my empty gas canister out of my trunk and walked out in the heat. I had a backpack of Gatorades and water bottles to avoid heat stroke. I was aware I could lose quite a bit of electrolytes very quickly. On the road I walked down, it was very complicated to call my sister Kelly to let her know where I was, and what the situation was, because there just did not seem to be signal anywhere. I walked and I walked, sticking my thumb out to no avail, for there were no reservation police or other passerby trucks. It seemed as if I was all alone out in the brightness, heated, sunshiny day out in the middle of freaking nowhere New Mexico. As I walked and I walked, I saw a dead hummingbird on the ground, I found that very sad, at first. Yet as I walked further and further, I found it odd that there was even a hummingbird there in the first place. They are not typically seen in the area from where I come from. They are not non-existent, but they're just super duper rare to see. There's not a bunch of what I would consider to be the sort of nectar they seek, nor pollen from flowers of which they desire. Further along, I continued down the open road with the sun beating down upon me. Soon after that, I saw another dead hummingbird. Now, I thought, this is getting weird. Weirder and weirder, perhaps. 
I suppose deep down, I sort of subconsciously preferred to consider it just a coincidence. It was only after a few hundred yards more that I saw another one, and then shortly after, another one, and another, and then another, and then more, and then even more. It came to a point where there were more constant dead hummingbirds started to trail away from the side of the road, and then make a trail off away and into the berm. This may have been a bad idea on my part, but my weakness has always been that my curiosity is preferred to get the better of me, which is what killed the cat. So, I followed the trail of dead hummingbirds. It was almost like a Hansel and Gretel breadcrumb trail. It seemed as if it was some sort of methodically laid out plan of follow the dead hummingbirds if you dare. It went on and on until I had passed the berm and completely away from the road and now in the arroyo and deep down amidst the few sparse trees to and fro and that was where I found it. It was... It was something I'm not sure I could ever describe. It was just like this this strange pile of dead hummingbirds. Like, like it was freaking huge. Maybe about two feet from the ground. A huge, massive, disturbing pile of them. I sort of stood there rather perplexed, and I scanned all around the place to see if there was more of an indication as to what transpired. Yet, there was nada. Nothing. Zilch. Zilch. It seemed as if there was just an inexplicable pile of dead hummingbirds out in the middle of the desert. It looked like a holocaust of them. That's when the real weirdness happened. There was this very strange, shaky, quivering sort of hum that was more than just audible. No, this was also physical. I cannot say that the ground was shaking. I would rather say it seemed as if my head did. I began to feel a bit nauseous, and the first thing I thought to myself was, get up on out of here. Like a coward, I did. I ran and I ran, and the worst decision I didn't even realize that I had made is I just started running randomly without any adherence from where I originally came from. Basically, I was just running in a direction without any regard. It took me a solid 30 to 45 minutes running throughout the arroyo to find the road again. Some native was driving down the road when I stumbled out from the side of the road, and he picked me up and gave me a ride to the casino that had a gas station, and when I filled up he offered to give me a ride back to my car. He could tell that I was shaken up, and I could sort of sense he didn't want to broach the subject, but sort of felt as if he should. So, he asked me if all was all right. I didn't want to go into it much, but I sort of explained a few of the details, but only a few, for fear of sounding like an absolute whack job. After what I had told him, his silence is what unnerved me the most. He either thought I was nuts, or he straight up did not want to talk about it. Eventually, that hum, he said, yeah, it makes me sick too. I filled up my tank, I went to work, I apologized for being late, and I explained what had happened. Nobody at my job site wanted to speak of it. Fast forward about a week and a half or so, perhaps two. My sister woke me up asking if I could sweep the front walkway, because she was too grossed out. I did not know what to infer, but I love my little sister, and I would do anything she asked. I suppose I wish she had told me it was just ridden with dead lizards, just laying on their backs, the bluish, gross veins exposed upon their bellies, ants upon ants just completely devouring them. It was, at best, disturbing. So, I got the push broom and I pushed them off the walkway, and that's when the hum began again, and I just sort of fell to my knees and could not stop feeling nauseous, and began vomiting a bit. My sister and I have always kept this from my ma, because I didn't know how she would react. 
I do not know what happens out there in that strange part of New Mexico, but I will say this. If you ever stumble across tiny dead animals, like a pile of them, just out in the middle of the desert, just leave it be. And if you hear the hum, never, ever return. For about five years, I worked corporate security for one of the richest families in Detroit, Michigan. The Illich family has cemented themselves into the zeitgeist of American history. Mike and Marion Illich founded Little Caesar's Pizza. A small one-store pizza shop led to a billion-dollar company. It includes owning two major sport franchises, several entertainment venues, and multiple food distributing companies. I was based in their headquarters, inside of the Fox Theater located in downtown Detroit. The legendary Fox Theater franchise used to have dozens of locations around the country. Now there's three left, I think. One here in Detroit, one in St. Louis, Missouri, and I don't know the last one without looking it up. One of my major duties was checking the Fox office building and theater after hours to make sure everything was secure. During the day, it ran as normal. At night, well, if you could imagine walking through an almost 70-year-old theater at night, you can see how freaky it could be. We had several shows per day, especially during the summer. Even during the off-season, we had a lot of kids' shows like Thomas the Train, Sesame Street, and various Christmas-like shows. One seemingly normal night, I made my rounds. I tried to make my way through the theater as quickly as I could. The lights were all off. I worked an 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. The city was usually dead at that time. When going into the backstage area during the first run of a Sesame Street show for the first time, I saw something that would eventually lead me to finding a new job. A show like Sesame Street that runs for almost three weeks brings a lot of logistical issues. There are so many costumes, so many actors. They have to keep the costumes clean and ready for the next show. They usually do two or three shows per day, sometimes even four or five on the weekends. My first time going through the bowels of the Fox Theater after a Sesame Street show, I naively made my way to the middle staging area. This is where the last looks would take place with artists and actors going on stage. I didn't know that they hung the mascot costumes up in this area for a show like this. As I entered the staging area, I saw an interesting sight. The heads of Count Dracula, Fozzie, and the old grumpy men sat on a shelf staring at me. Tubes ran in and out of all of them. It stopped me in my tracks, but then I quickly realized what it was and wasn't so shocked. They clean the costumes and have air going into them. But then I saw something move to my right. Frozen. A Freddy Fazbear type character standing on two feet slowly turns to face me. My stupid head can't make sense of what I'm seeing. I only describe it as the main character from Five Nights at Freddy's because I couldn't think of what this character was. I didn't recognize it as a Sesame Street character. A decade later, and the Five Nights franchise blew up like a California wildfire. How was it possible I saw the Freddy costume before that game was even an inkling in our world? He slowly made eye contact with me. As silly as that seems, I only thought one thing. Run. I exited that hellscape staging area as fast as I could. I hit the first set of stairs I could and went down for whatever reason. Now, I was in the sub-basement. A place for crew and actors to make an easy, fast path to one side of the stage to the other. I took a breath outside of one of the bathrooms for the crew and staff. What did I just see? Was that the wind? 
Did I really just see a bear-like humanoid animatronic turn to face me? There's no way. I am trying to make sense of this. I am a rational person. I don't believe in sentient Sesame Street characters. It's just a show. Satisfied that I suffered from an overactive imagination, I laughed off my embarrassment and continued my theater check. What an idiot for running from a costume. I need to make sure all the bathrooms are locked as part of my regular nightly duties, so I continued with the one that I'm standing right outside of. Now that I actually look at it, the door is about two inches open. This shouldn't be possible. The door is heavy. Everything in this theater is old and made from strong materials from decades ago. No plastic. No composite. The door should be closed. I squinted my eyes and took one cautious step toward the door. With a deep breath and a shaky hand, I reached out to push the door open, make sure no one was inside. As my fingertips were less than a centimeter away from the door, it slammed shut in my face with an unnatural force. I could feel the reverb and the wind go through me as if a small nuclear bomb went off. I didn't stay to investigate. I turned tail and found my way to the exit as soon as I could. Before I knew it, I was finally outside. The world around me finally started again. Streetlights turned red and green. Cars and trucks whirled by. The smells of the sewer entered my nostrils. I never thought I would be so happy to smell the crap smells of the city. Better than seeing a sentient bear and whatever slammed that bathroom door in my face. I had just turned 21 and frequented the bars regularly. In hindsight, I probably spent too much time drinking with my friends. I didn't have a car or a cell phone, and I lived on the outskirts of town. It was a 45-minute walk downtown. The town I live in is generally a very safe place. It is a wealthy, well-to-do community, so walking home alone at night after drinking was nothing that bothered me, other than the actual walking. It was a Tuesday night, and that meant pints were cheap, so I wouldn't say I was completely wasted, but I certainly was more than tipsy. Instead of walking home along the sidewalk where I feared I'd be picked up by the police for being drunk in public, I decided to take the bike path that ran along the train tracks. This meant the walk would take longer, but much safer, and less likely I would run into any sort of trouble. The bike path was not very lit, and knowing what I know now, I should have been a lot more nervous about walking alone in the complete darkness at 2 in the morning. Like I said, I had just turned 21 and was certainly an arrogant young male who was thinking about women and not minding my surroundings. I had taken this path many nights and coming across anybody else was rare. If I did perchance come across somebody this late at night, most of the time it was just another drunk college student who had the same thoughts as me. Either that or they were homeless, but if so, I would say they were all homeless. So this night as I'm walking, I noticed further down the path was somebody walking towards me. He wore a large hiking backpack and had his hoodie pulled over his head. It was so dark, I couldn't see their face. I could really only just barely make out their outline. This person's gait unquestionably revealed him to be a male, who I figured was probably just a transient. It was odd to see somebody walking towards downtown at 2 in the morning. When I got really close to him, and we were about to cross paths. This person just stopped dead in his tracks, and I could tell he was staring at me, because his head just followed me as I walked by. It creeped me out a bit, and I certainly felt that it was a bit odd. As I continued to walk, shrugging at the situation, I just didn't feel right. Something in my gut made me feel... wrong. I stopped and turned around to see this person still staring at me. What? 
I asked him as I stopped walking and remained to stare back at him. That's when he hissed at me, like a snake. A long, vicious-sounding hiss that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I had hoped that he was just being weird, or perhaps was on something. I nervously laughed a bit and said, Okay, and continued to walk on. I made it a few more steps and turned to look back. He somehow managed to get closer to me without making a sound. He stood completely still. I figured perhaps I was just drunk and imagining things. I turned back around and walked, taking a few more steps. I turned around once more. Now I knew he was closer. I couldn't believe that I couldn't hear him approaching behind me. What unsettled me even more was how every time I turned around, he would manage to stop and stand completely still. Uh, are you following me, buddy? Once again, he let out this creepy hiss, just staring at me. Now I was freaked out and had this strange sensation that I was some sort of prey. Hey, screw you, man, I now yelled. In hindsight, this was a bad idea, but because I already felt like I was some sort of target, and the last thing I should have been wanting to do is provoke this sick, twisted guy. I started backing away at this point, not taking my eyes off of him. He just stood there, hissing. The hisses were getting longer, louder, and more malintention was apparent in them. As he started to hiss louder and louder, he began to engage in some sort of pursuit. At first, they were basic steps, but the further I backed away, the more he sped up, taking bigger steps towards me. I said, screw this, to myself. I'm getting out of here. I noped it out of there and began into a full-fledged run. He started running after me. I could hear his heavy boots gaining on me, hissing like a cat, growling like a dog. I feel his spit hitting me in the back of my neck. Get away from me, you sick bastard! I might have peed myself, I was so scared. All I could think to do was run as fast as I could to get inside of my house as quickly as possible. I've always been a very fast runner, but this guy was much taller than me and his legs were really long, so he was really cutting down the distance between him and me. I managed to keep a good five feet between us though, checking back behind me as I saw his arms reaching out in an attempt to grab me. I finally made it out of the bike path and onto the crossing sidewalk of the street that was lit up by the street lamps and a few passing cars. I was so relieved to finally make it back to civilization. There was a gas station over by my house and I thought I would run to the safety of it inside, only to see that the lights had been shut off and the doors were closed. Crap. I had to make it to my house. As I got closer to my house, I could see my roommate's lights were on through the window. Chris! I shouted. Chris, open the door! Open the door! I'm impressed I yelled loud enough that he actually heard me. I saw the front door of my house open up, and my roommate standing at the doorway looking confused. I ran up the steps and almost jumped inside my house, slamming the door shut behind me. Dude, what are you running from? He asked. You didn't see that guy chasing me? No. I ran to the window and looked outside. He was gone. I have no idea what happened to him. But that guy... He scared the crap out of me. One night, it had been getting late, and I had just got in from spending time with some friends. I was getting pretty hungry, so I decided to make an order for pizza delivery. I was home by myself and my two dogs. After about 45 minutes, I heard the doorbell ring. We didn't have a normal doorbell. It was a doorbell camera. Normally, I wouldn't check the camera to see who it was if I was expecting someone. As I walked to the front door, I hesitated and something told me to check the camera. 
Although I was worrying that I was taking too long, I pulled up my app and checked to see who it was. The pizza guy was there as expected, and our gate behind him was open since you had to go through a gate to get to the front door. I could also see what looked like his car parked on the street through the open gate. I almost opened the door when I noticed an older woman walk up the driveway. I stopped and watched her on my phone. She just walked up the driveway, through the open gate, past the pizza delivery guy, and stood in front of my door, closer to the part that opened up. I realized she was waiting for me to open the door to get my pizza. Although she didn't seem to have any weapons, this instantly freaked me out. I felt almost scared for the pizza guy because he couldn't have been older than maybe 19 or 20, but I was not going to open the door. I enabled the talk feature on the doorbell, and I asked who she was. I did this so she would know that I was watching, and so that the pizza guy would know that she is not supposed to be there. After hearing me speak through the doorbell, she looked at it and immediately turned her body around so her back was to the camera. She also backed up closer to it, so I couldn't see much more than her back. I told her that she needed to leave, and that I did not know her. At first, she didn't leave, but after more aggressively demanding she gets off my property, or I'm calling the cops, she started to walk back down the driveway. I told the pizza guy to leave the food on the ground because he needed to get out of there. He dropped it said he was worried she might steal his car, and jogged down to his car and drove away. I didn't see the woman, so I opened up my door and I quickly closed the gate, got my food, and locked myself back in the house. I still had my app open with a live view of the front, and I saw her walk up the driveway again, and open the gate. I felt a little stupid for going out after I saw she never really left. She seemed to have been looking to the right, where our garage was, almost as if she was looking at someone I couldn't see. I went and grabbed the butcher knife from the kitchen. She started banging on the security screen door. I opened up the door so that the only thing that separated us was the security screen and I yelled at her telling her to leave me alone with some other expletives, hoping that this would make me seem like I am not worth the trouble. I slammed the door in her face. She said some things that I couldn't make out, but almost like she was talking to herself... She started walking through the gate and then about halfway down the driveway and back up again, like she was pacing. She was looking to the right, like there was something or someone off camera that I couldn't see. Closing the app at this point was the last thing I wanted to do because I had to see what she or they were doing, but I knew I had to call the police. I called 911 and tried looking through the peephole in the door, but I couldn't see very well. I explained that a woman tried to enter my house with a pizza delivery guy. The dispatcher said that some officers would be there soon, asked me questions to get more details, and told me to hide in a room in the house in case she or they broke in. The whole time I was worrying that if she went around the back, she would have seen the sliding glass door which would have been an easy way in. I was hiding in my bedroom with my two dogs and my knife when the dispatcher said the officers were there. I heard a loud knock on the front door shortly after. The police found the woman and had her in handcuffs. They asked me some more questions about what happened and then they left. I didn't hear anything back from them, but I did post it in my city's Facebook group chat about what happened along with the video from my doorbell camera. Some people commented and I found out some more information about what happened to her. The officers let the woman go for some reason and shortly after, she tried the same thing at my neighbor's house across the street. They heard me yelling at the woman and also my front door slamming earlier, so they had already been somewhat aware of what was going on. Unsuccessful in her attempt there, she went to a house a couple streets down and broke in, and was armed with a knife. Although there were not many details, the people living there seemed to have been more prepared than me, since they handled the situation and the police arrested her again and took her to a mental hospital. I didn't hear any word of whether anyone else was involved, but that experience was definitely something I will not forget. Thankfully, I have moved to another city since, and I now have security screens 
on all of my doors. I remember it was unusual for there to be fog in that time of year out along the beaches of LA. I will not divulge where or when precisely, as to avoid as much condescension for sounding like a madman. It was bonfire night, where all folks in the neighborhood and all others considered to be cool enough were all invited out to the beach, and so, thus, all of us went, friends and strangers alike, out to the beach out to smoke and drink and witness the younger, crazy kids spin fire and poi and all of that other stuff they're so into. The reason that I was there at all was because I had a friend named Ben who absolutely insisted I come along to this cool bonfire party out along the beach. Ben's always been a great guy. I've known him for 25 years. He was on Broadway, cast predominantly as a singer, I was proud, and also I was the best man at his wedding. I know this man, but things can change. There was this girl, and she seemed really cool. Long, blonde hair, curves, magnetic blue eyes, a dream come true. For me, that is. I sat out there away from the bonfire, upon a log, contemplating other things and also contemplating this girl, this beautiful girl who comes up to me and introduces herself. Me, of all people. She asks, What are you doing sitting here all by your lonesome? You want to rip this? I would have been a fool not to partake. So of course, yours truly, your humble narrator. Well, I'll just say it was partaken. So yeah, I got stoned. She was hot. Don't judge me. Like I had mentioned prior, I found it strange that it was such an unusually foggy, misty night at this locale, at this time of year. It was almost as if a cloud had decided to drop onto the beach line, which is strange. Next thing I know, Ben approaches me and the cute girl I was talking to at that moment, and he asks me, Want to take a walk? That seemed like a strange question to me because I had supposed it was readily apparent that I was totally satisfied where I was and where I sat being interviewed by a bombshell buxom blonde. Her and I inexplicably both said, yes, and onward and onward into the night we went, further into the fog and into the mist, with absolutely no regard to our questions or our instincts. Yet, I do vaguely remember feeling like I was being called to do something from somewhere I knew not. It was such an odd feeling, looking back upon it now. So Ben, this girl, and I, we walked off past the bonfire, past the organic light source, and into the inexplicable fog and mystery. One of the last things I remember from that evening is seeing a big, bright light enraptured protectively by the mist and fog, and so, of course, I thought to myself, yeah, man, why not? And so on I walked trying to walk into the light obscured by the smoke and fog and mist and cloud and whatnot. I woke up with my alarm clock off like madness at three in the afternoon, a setting I have never set it upon. I was late for work. Upon my thigh rested, a nasty BB-sized bump that rested in a sort of obsessive trance. I could not leave it alone. All I wanted to do was pick and scratch at it. The workplace was already amiss from the moment I set my foot through the door. The owner of the establishment already says to me, Rick, I need to speak with you in my office. Walking into the office of this piece of crap I worked with for so long... I was ever so curious what he had to say this time. Why didn't you come into work yesterday? I'm sorry I was late. I usually make it by my two o'clock shift and... And then the interruption happened, in which he said, Yeah, you were supposed to be at work at two yesterday and now, here you are, 
a day late and a dollar short. So, I left. I left because I was confused. I sort of remembered being with Ben the night prior, so I figured he'd be able to fill in the details. He's always been an awesome friend like that. So yeah, I drove to Huntington Beach to visit him and his wife at his apartment complex. Now, I have always known that Cleo was a shy woman, but I had earned my stripes with her, and I was best man at her wedding. It was so strange to see her with the chains and the bolts attached to the door as she opened it. Yeah? She asked me. Hey, Cleo, I said. I was hoping to speak with Ben. He can't speak, is what she replied with. Onward and onward into the light we walked. Into the mist. Into the fog. But the strange beacon of light that dwelled inside of it, that is the one that kept us all going. Into the white light I walked. What? I asked her. He doesn't want to speak to me? No, she said. It's not that he doesn't want to speak with you, he just cannot speak. This was an immediate thing and or occurrence that perturbed me. I mean, like, what? Decidingly, I barged in through the door to check it upon my best friend, where in which I found him lying upon the floor struggling to scream, with the most clog-stopped guttural sound protruding from his throat. It's in my... It's in my voice. It's in my throat. He wriggled and riled on the floor, and Cleo and I witnessed him convulse upon the floor before he just fell asleep again. This was a man who performed on Broadway, and he had the voice of an angel. For someone to scream at me in a night terror daydream walk. Yeah, it's scary when one says, It's in my voice. It's in my throat. I figured my best friend had a thing going on, and alone is where I left him. When I returned home, however, is where I began with the picking and scratching, and the BB-sized bump I had been picking at it more and more, so then it just popped out of my leg, just like a BB-sized bullet would when not being pursued. It rolled underneath the refrigerator. So yeah, in a bit of bewilderment, there I sat just witnessing. I sat in the kitchen with the tension and the silence and being a part of a foreign, alien BB rolled outside of my thigh and under the refrigerator and, yes, I asked myself, what just popped out of my body? Ben and I never got to speak much after that. I never got to explain how there was a hole taken out of my thigh. I never got to ask him how it could ever be possible that he and I lost an entire day. Why did he scream if it was in his throat, in his voice? Oftentimes, I am asked by others if I speak to Ben these days. I do, but not much anymore, and not in the same way, unfortunately. When we do speak to each other, he absolutely refuses to discuss what happened that evening. It's frustrating for me because I have so many questions. Oftentimes I am asked to reveal the whole punch taken out of my thigh, and it looks insane. And I'm tired of the crosstalk. I can't explain it. Most folks tell me I was just high, or something within that caliber. But when you've done every drug underneath the sun, it's rather easy to tell them when you might have experienced something that did not happen within this world, within this universe. And I ask myself almost every day, what exactly happened? Where did I go? What happened to my best friend? Why did that blonde beauty disappear? And how exactly did I lose an entire day out of my life? And why is there a hole in my thigh? I like to think I'd certainly remember that sort of pain being inflicted upon me. Seriously. Dude, why is there a hole in my thigh?
For many years, 53-year-old Robert Wilson was employed at pharmaceutical manufacturer Thornton Ross in Huddersfield, over in the UK. He worked the night shift, in charge of site security, and he was good at his job, too. During his tenure at Thornton Ross, there hadn't been a single break-in or incident of vandalism, and he was well on his way to a promotion of head of security. Robert had suffered some serious misfortune in his time and was forced to change careers several times during his life. But for the first time in a long time, everything was going well for him and it seemed his luck was finally beginning to turn. Yet, a chance encounter with two teenage boys early last year was all it took to bring his whole world crashing down. At approximately 11 p.m. on January 16th, 2020, Robert was watching the CCTV monitors in the site's security office when he noticed two shadowy figures wandering around the facility's parking lot. Robert gathered up a colleague by the name of John Vadejo, along with another security officer, and the trio went to investigate. There they found that the two shadowy figures were nothing more than young boys in the form of 16-year-old Luke Gokroger and 19-year-old Kieran Earnshaw, and that the two boys seemed to be very drunk. When confronted as to why they were roaming around the parking lot so late at night, the boys appeared apologetic at first, explaining that they had merely attempted to navigate a shortcut through the facility, but that one of them had managed to drop their phone in the process. Being the compassionate soul that he was, Robert agreed to help the boys find the missing cell phone. He also knew that the quicker he could help them find the phone, the quicker they would be out of his hair. Robert took out his own phone, turning on the flashlight to help illuminate the dark parking lot so the group would be able to find the missing phone. In doing so, he happened to accidentally shine the flashlight in one of the teenagers' directions. Kieran Earnshaw, in his drunken state, assumed this was because Robert was making a video recording of him and demanded he turn the phone off. Confused, Robert assured Kieran that he was simply using the flashlight feature, but Kieran didn't believe him and angrily demanded that he stop. At this point, harsh words were exchanged between the two, and a confrontation arose, but Robert could have never expected what would follow. Kieran reached into his tracksuit pants and produced an actual sword from them. Apparently, it was intended to be nothing more than a decorative ornament, but Kieran had taken the time to sharpen it and apply grip tape to the handle, turning what should have been a charming adornment into a deadly weapon. He began to attack Robert Wilson with the sword, slashing and striking him with it over and over again. Robert raised his right hand to defend himself, and the strike that followed was said to sever four of his fingers at once. John Badejo watched in horror as his colleague's bloody fingers tumbled to the tarmac below and rushed to his defense. But Kieran was quick and saw John's approach out of the corner of his eye. He turned, swinged the sword hard in his direction, slicing through the thick fabric of his jacket and sending sharpened steel plunging into his flesh. John Badejo backed off, clenching at the fresh wound, while Kieran turned his attentions back to Robert Wilson, who by that point was attempting to crawl away, mortally wounded. Kieran began hacking away at him again. As Robert's colleagues fled the scene, the blood-curdling scream of their wounded friend echoing around the parking lot as they ran. Kieran's friend, Luke, then joined the attack pulling out a knife from his jacket and began to stab the fallen Robert over and over again, until he screamed no more. CCTV footage had managed to capture every second of the attack from start to finish, and the two teenagers were quickly tracked down and arrested by the West Yorkshire Police. Under advice from their defense attorneys, both pled guilty to Robert's murder, Kieran Earnshaw was sentenced to life. Luke Gawkroger was sentenced to a minimum term of 16 years and 17 days. 
Kieran also pleaded guilty to inflicting serious bodily harm on the second victim, John Badejo, and Luke pleaded guilty to the possession of an offensive weapon. James Goddard of Britain's Crown Prosecution Service said that this was a ferocious and frenzied attack on an innocent man who was simply carrying out his duties. The two teenagers inflicted a horrific level of violence on Mr. Wilson, as well as seriously injuring Mr. Badejo. The two defendants are now facing significant jail sentences. Our thoughts remain with Mr. Wilson's family and friends as they have been throughout. When questioned by investigating police, Kieran Earnshaw was apparently unable to provide any legitimate reason as to why he was carrying a sword. He claimed it was for self-defense, but when pressed on who he was seeking to defend himself from, he had no response except to shrug. The only conclusion that we can draw is that Kieran was carrying that sword because he wished to use it on another human being, and he was not particularly fussy on who that might be. There's every chance that Kieran knew that Robert Wilson wasn't recording him that night, and that he simply chose to feign outrage so that he had an excuse to take out that sword and end a man's life. Kieran had been out drinking that day for hours on end and was apparently carrying that sword with him the whole time, but he opted to use it at night, possibly because it was the only time he was drunk enough to do so. Yet is there not something about the dark of the night that brings out the most predatory and violent side of a man? So the point remains. If Robert Wilson had been working the day shift, if he had been safely inside his own home when the sun had gone down, he might still be alive. Today. I was 27 and working at a Boy Scout camp far up in the woods of very northerly Northern California. Where I worked had a large population of black bears, which for the most part were rather harmless and easy enough to scare away with a shot from a rifle. However, we had a large number of Boy Scouts at this camp weekly, sometimes as many as 500 heads and with a lot of vastly spread out campsites, there's going to be a few campers who sleep with candy bars in their pockets and basically make themselves a prepackaged dinner snack for a bear. I tell you this, black bears love Reese's peanut butter cups. As part of staff, oftentimes I was scheduled for bear watch and basically strolled the entirety of the camp with a weapon, going from site to site making my presence known so as to ensure the bearers wouldn't come anywhere near. On one of these routine nights, everything was more still and more quiet than usual, and I remember finding it rather odd and unsettling. I had just checked in on the camp the furthest away from all the other campsites. It was a good half mile away from base proper. As I'm strolling along the trail that runs beside the lake, I stopped to take a number one and light a joint that I had stashed away for such an occasion for being out by the lake at two in the morning. As human beings, we have natural gut feelings that we must always adhere to for our survival. There was definitely a gut feeling I had that things were amiss. Not only was it unusually still and quiet, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched and that I was most certainly not alone. I nervously took a few puffs from my J and then put it out, now being more aware of the unnerving sense in the air. I have been face to face with a bear. I have been stalked by a mountain lion. I have slept a little too close to a den of coyotes late in the night. But this was different. I didn't have the sense that I was in the presence of any of these animals. The smell was overwhelming. It didn't smell like any bear I've experienced. It was almost sour, but still... musky. I'll never forget the smell. 
but I can never find the words to properly describe it. As I reached for my flashlight before considering readying my weapon, a massive boom hit the ground, falling from the trees above and nearly knocking me on my butt from the sheer force of it. I reached for my flashlight that had fallen to the ground as I heard something large, something massive, running away from me into the tree line, up into the hill above. Immediately I considered it was probably the biggest bear I had ever come across, and black bears can be spooked easily. So at first, I considered myself lucky, but as I lay there, hyperventilating, shaking, and quaking in my boots, I started to consider the sound of the beast running away. It didn't sound like the stride of a black bear in flight. It sounded bipedal. It sounded... human. I braced myself, stood up, readied my weapon, released the safety, and shot upward into the air toward the lake. It woke many campers and the scoutmasters alike. I stood out there for a good ten minutes alone before camp leader and some other staff came to me. During that time, I had my flashlight out and was inspecting the scene. Whatever had dropped from the branches above fell from possibly twenty feet, and in its wake of running away, had torn off branches off into the hill line that stood thirteen feet from the ground, and some smaller trees were bent almost all the way down into the ground. I have never seen a bear do that, that's for sure. By the time some of the staff and some concerned campers arrived, everybody was stumped. Most campers, to comfort themselves, insisted it was just a bear. I do know this. No bear running on all fours stands 13 feet tall, and no bear can run on two feet for 12 yards uphill on two legs. They just don't do that. We are all thinking it, so I'll just say it. I think I encountered a Sasquatch that night. If not, I don't know what it was, but I'm glad it was running away from me and not at me, because whatever that thing was, beast or man, it was gargantuan, and I would not have stood a chance if it had decided to confront me. There really is no better way to describe Monroe County, West Virginia than the middle of nowhere. One of the state's most southerly counties, Monroe is perhaps the most overwhelmingly rural place in the entire eastern United States. There is not a single stoplight or fast food outlet anywhere in the whole county, and it has one of the lowest population densities of any county in the whole nation. Much like any rural area of the eastern U.S., Monroe has its fair share of problems with opiate addiction and the crimes associated with it. But a disappearance or a murder is a rare event indeed, and when one actually occurs, it stirs up rather a lot of attention from citizens and law enforcement alike. So in April of 2007, when a dark red Chevy pickup truck was found abandoned behind a derelict building in Peterstown, it sent ripples of fear through the small community in which it was discovered. And it's because the truck belonged to a man named Timothy Wayne Dalton. And by that point, Timothy had been missing for almost three weeks. According to his missing person's profile, Timothy was just over 200 pounds and had dark brown hair and pale blue eyes. He was last seen wearing a dark blue button-up shirt, light gray shorts, and black Nike sneakers. There's a good chance he was also wearing a dog tag necklace, a relic of a relative's military service, and was also carrying a pocket knife. Close friends stated that he sometimes went unshaven for maybe a week at a time, but was never known to sport any kind of lengthy facial hair and was known to talk with a subtle stutter. In the brief period before the truck was found, 
local sheriff's deputies had managed to build up a picture of the events that had preceded Timothy's disappearance. He had paid a visit to his mother on March 26th, and had apparently behaved perfectly regularly for the most part. They made small talk about his firewood cutting job, which as lowly as it seemed, made Timothy's mother very proud that her son was gainfully employed, especially when the economy was tanking in such a dreadful way. But at certain points, Timothy's mother noticed that he was acting rather skittishly, peering out of her trailer window every so often, as if watching for something, or someone. It's not entirely unusual for a boy to act in a protective manner over his beloved mother, so she didn't think too much of his watchful behavior. Yet, this was the last time her son was ever seen alive, with the only clue to his potential whereabouts being the abandoned truck that was found a fortnight and a half later. Despite his mother's concerns, local law enforcement insisted that there was no foul play involved in his disappearance. Yet there are solid reports from reputable sources that when the truck was discovered, the window on the driver's side of the vehicle was found to be broken, with glass lying on the interior, indicating it had been smashed from the outside. Despite this, police declared that there was no clear indication that there had been any kind of struggle, speculating that the window might have well been broken before or after he had disappeared. Speaking to Timothy's family members, police heard how it would be very out of character for Timothy to just vanish without at least informing them that he was going somewhere. And while it was a well-known fact that Timothy had dabbled in some non-violent crime in the past, he had no outstanding warrants and was not a suspect in any recent burglary case. He had been described by many as a timid fellow with a heart of gold. And as far as his friends know, he was not involved in the narcotics trade, either as a dealer or a user. This essentially eliminated the possibility that he had skipped town out of fear of being arrested for something, a theory that was compounded by the fact that pretty much all of his meager belongings could still be found at his place of residence. As it stands, there are two prevailing theories that attempt to explain Timothy's disappearance. The first is that, for whatever reason, he owed money to a one-percenter motorcycle gang that sometimes passed through the area. This theory came about due to the fact that at the time he vanished, Timothy's sister was dating a Hell's Angel who was patched to a Princeton chapter of the gang, a town just a half hour away from Peterstown. As a frequent drug user, she was careless with her finances and it's very possible that the angels passed along whatever debt she owed to her blood relatives. Then, when Timothy couldn't pay up, the angels decided to make an example out of him. The second theory revolves around a rumor that Timothy had bad blood with a local deputy who was supposedly violent, unstable, and corrupt. It was common knowledge among members of the Peterstown community that one particular area police officer believed he was above the law. This same officer happened to give Timothy a ticket during a traffic stop one day, one that Timothy insisted was unfairly cited. He swore he'd see the cop in court. Then, to the surprise of the local townsfolk, he did and ended up actually winning the case. He was awarded sizable compensation, and the cop in question was disciplined for his apparent misconduct. It was a humiliation, one the officer couldn't ever get over. And as much as this particular cop was an embarrassment to the force, there's every chance that a bunch of good old boy deputies would close ranks around him should he have decided to take a little revenge. This would most definitely explain how the reports of a broken window suddenly morphed into a conclusion of no signs of a struggle. Yet these two theories, as elaborate as they may seem, are still little more than conjecture. So the question remains, what could have happened to Timothy Dalton? It certainly wouldn't have been easy for him to leave Monroe County without his truck, as it truly is in the middle of nowhere, with no local taxi companies in the area, or bus routes running through it. 
The only explanation is that someone picked him up, conscious or unconscious, dead or alive, and took him out of Monroe. Peterstown has a population of just less than 700. People talk, people see things, but apparently nobody saw hide nor hair of Timothy after he had visited his mother's place. The woods around the town might be dark and deep, but they're actually commonly frequented by local hunters who often scour the backwoods for fresh meat to put on the table to save a few dollars on the grocery bill. Surely if Timothy was murdered and dumped in the woods, a hunter, or perhaps a hunting dog, would have come across his remains at some point. As far as I can tell, it really is as if the guy just disappeared, dropped off the face of the earth one day for some unknown reason. But maybe it's the case that whoever did disappear Timothy knew a little too much about the process of searching and finding someone. Maybe it was a person who had experience in finding bodies, who for professional reasons would know the most effective method of making someone just up and vanish without leaving so much as a trace of them behind. But whoever that might be is still completely up for debate. Yet perhaps it might be better if we avoid any kind of heavy speculation. Least we offend the wrong person. A person who might just be violent, unstable, and corrupt. Around the time that I was about 22 or 23, I was a paid professional stage actor. It was one of the most wonderful gigs I have ever had in my life, with the exception of one experience. The theater building itself was supposedly haunted. I myself by now can sort of confirm that it is, unless what happened to me was something else that I just straight up cannot ever explain for the rest of my days. To give the backstory, the theater building I worked at was a library prior, around the 1920s through the 30s. However, when a young girl was assaulted and murdered and left in the middle of an aisle upstairs without anybody noticing or hearing, the library was immediately shut down. It was a thing. A few decades went on. And then, around the 1960s, they turned the old library into a round stage theater with a catwalk up by the ceiling. Even before I was cast in the production, I had already been aware that the theater was supposedly haunted. Of course I was intrigued, but I knew better than to tempt spirits by taunting them or making fun of them. That's just bad juju so I just sort of ignored the stories and the tall tales of the ghost. The stories were all the same from the other actors who had worked in the theater building. It's a little girl, they'd all say. She doesn't like women, they'd all say. She has crushes on certain boys, they'd all say. That was the word on the street and in the building. Okay, okay, now... While being in this production, I had a fellow cast member who was just a bombshell of a woman. Gorgeous. Intelligent. A dancer. Everything that makes a woman wonderful. A wonder woman, if you will. She was almost technically a dwarf. She stood at a whopping four foot nine. I don't like using words like tiny or small, but I mean... Jules stands at a whopping four foot nine. She's short, you know? Never underestimate that, though. That girl can still kick your butt. Always be weary of tiny dancers, because they have the strength and discipline. Jules and I still talk to this day, as friends. She told me once that she was in the woman's dressing room, about 20 minutes before curtain. She was sitting down on a chair combing her hair, looking at herself in the mirror after applying her makeup. And then there was a tug from her long hair that pulled her all the way down from out of her chair onto the floor. To this day, she swears she was the only person in the woman's changing room. 
There was just no explanation for it. No explanation she can come up with. And she's smart and doesn't lie. Jules is not a liar, and she does not tolerate fancy stories. So, of course, everybody, myself included, believed her. It was strange. Kodai was this really handsome man who was almost losing his mind, because his props and costumes would just disappear out of thin air, and were never anywhere to be found. He would scream and yell before Curtin. I had my bench right here. I had my shoes over there. Why are they gone? I promise you I did not move them. Yeah, he would say that every night before Curtin. There was a kid. I forget his name, but he played the young boy in the show. And always, always he would say, Every night during intermission, I am standing backstage waiting for my cue to walk on stage for the beginning of Act 2. There is a breathing thrust upon the back of my neck, and every single time I turn my head, there's nothing there. And I'm scared. This poor kid was probably about 12 or 13, at best. And to me, when I was about 23, well, to me, it sounded terrifying. Savannah was my scene partner, and she and I had gone to high school together, so the camaraderie was already there. So when she told me that she felt terrified to be alone in the theater, I believed her. She had a part of Act 2 where she was required to be on the catwalk to drop a long canvas that was a sort of the backdrop visually for a scene. Savannah would get tired though, and while she would lay there on the catwalk hoping not to be seen, she would accidentally start to fall asleep. If she fell asleep, the production would have consequences if the scene change could not happen. Every night, she said to me, every night I fall asleep and then moments before my cue, I hear a little girl's voice say, coo 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 loo loo loo, and then I wake up and drop the canvas sheet and get back downstairs to make sure I get on stage on time. Every single night this happens. So onward, onto my part of the story and or experience. There was this matinee on a Saturday. After the matinee, we got our dinner break and the entire cast would go take dinner and converse and enjoy ourselves. We had our 8 o'clock show and another at midnight. I decided to head back to the theater building early so I might pass out on the couch and sleep for a few hours before I had to get back into costume. Yada yada. Saying that, it must be made clear that I had had the keys to the building, and I could open up the theater doors once I approached the theater doors. I was actually trusted enough for that. Perhaps that was a curse within its very own self. Logically, the first task I always presented myself with was to turn on all the lights around the building, which I did this evening. There was a bathroom downstairs and there was a bathroom upstairs. For an inexplicable reason to me, some thought in my head that I had that I still cannot explain even to this day. I decided to use the upstairs bathroom, which was located by the costume storage. I had never really used it before and it does not seem sensical to me, but that was the choice that I had made. I marched up the curling, winding, spiraling stairs built way back in the day. I turned on the lights upstairs and proceeded down the hallway and into the bathroom and turned on the bathroom lights. It felt off to me. The air. The energy. The spirit of it all. It was very strange to me. It was very unsettling, unnerving, and awkward. I figured it was due to me being completely alone in the theater building, especially at nighttime. Only then did thoughts enter my mind. It's a little girl, they'd all say. She doesn't like women, they'd all say. She has crushes on certain boys, they'd all say. Reasonably, the thoughts put me on edge, and I got super nervous-like 
shivering at a cold chill that was absent from the room. When I had finished with my business, consistently looking back behind me, I opened the bathroom door to find that all of the lights had been shut off. The entirety of the theater was pitch black, with the exception of the bathroom whereupon I had just turned on the lights. Through that little light protruding from the bathroom, it traced along the hallway, and looking down it, I saw the silhouette of Jules. Ah, I said to myself playfully. She turned off the lights and wants to fool around. I had been feeling tired and sort of wanted to nap, but no young man in his right mind turns down the opportunity to get in on some frisky action, especially when such an attractive lady is insisting. I marked where she was standing in the hallway, and as the door closed behind me and the hallway became breached with complete darkness, I had already calculated where she was standing, saying, Hey, you... As I approached where she stood, I put my arms out for an embrace. There was no response, though. There was nothing there. Oh, I see, I said excitedly. You want to play games with me. So I walked further and further down the hallway, putting my hands out in front of me. I realized I had made it to the costume storage. Racks and racks of old clothes and wardrobe and costumes. Aisles and aisles of them. In the complete darkness, I put my hands here and there, feeling my way around, touching the fabrics that hung on their hangers on the racks. Expecting to find jewels, it ended up just resulting in more searching. Where are you? I asked. Come on, where are you? That was when it started to sink in. That's when it hit me. This feeling of being watched. Being witnessed. Being warned. There was this insatiable amount of dread percolating through my blood vessels. Immediately, I was very, very uncomfortable. And scared. That's when the giggle came. Not a laugh. A soft, silly, child-sounding giggle. Who's there? Who is that? I asked. A jacket of some sort, or something, fell off of its hanger and landed on my shoulders, draped around me. I cannot remember if I screamed. I just may have. But I knew I ran. In the dark, into a hundred of other clothing racks that shook and fell. It took me some time to readjust where I was and to get my bearings and figure out what part of the room I was in. Finally finding the spiral stairway, I ended up completely bombing it, completely failing and just falling down the stairs like a ragdoll. After a loud moan from feeling like I had just busted my ribs, I found my footing and ran into a few walls before I finally found the front doors. I burst them open so quickly and I just ran. I didn't care if I left them unlocked. Running down into the parking lot, the whole cast and crew were approaching. There was Jules, along with all of them. There was just no way she was ever even in the theater. Hey! I shouted at her. Did you just mess with me? What? She looked at me inquisitively. No? What are you talking about? I thought I saw you in there. I told her, panicking. You turned off the lights. The stage manager for the show just looked at me calmly, plain as day. Oh, that's just the ghost. If she turns off the lights, it just means she likes you. The entirety of the production prior had led me to no experiences with said ghost, and nothing ever happened after that, either. So, I grow curious from time to time whenever I ponder upon it. What happened? Was it in my head? A trick of the light? And when I grow more curious, I wonder why then, when so many others were having these strange experiences and I wasn't, 
Why did it happen then, when I was all alone? It's a little girl. She doesn't like women. She has crushes on certain boys. As flattered as I should have been, to this day, I still am terrified whenever I think about it. I haven't worked for that theater ever since. My body was cold to the touch. Distant sounds of rain patter onto the tent as I slowly awaken from my sleep. I realize that I rested a little longer than usual, so I sit myself up and check the time on my phone. It was 3 a.m. This was my third day of camping, and even though I was excited to go, things felt a little redundant after a while. I noticed that my friend Jessica was not in the tent with me. Maybe she went to the bathroom? There are 15 other campers on the reserve for our field trip. Each tent is relatively close to one another. Our chaperones are in cabins located about 800 feet away. Out of curiosity, I text Jessica. Where are you, Braceface? By this time, almost 20 minutes had passed. Something seemed off. I knew she couldn't have been in someone else's tent because she's very particular about the people she's around. Plus, we weren't allowed to do that. Just as I begin to leave the tent, a flash of thunder shocks me in fear as I settle back down. Rain begins to pour down heavily. Jessica's going to be mad that her hair is wet. Assuming that she had went to the bathroom, I fell back to sleep while listening to the rain. After about an hour, I jolt up from my pillow with a noise outside. It was the most disturbing thing I had ever heard. It was blood-curdling and sounded like a banshee. Now at this point, I was concerned. Once again, Jessica still hadn't came back to the tent. I checked my phone and also noticed that she never texted me back. This was strange. It was time to stop being a wuss and get out of the tent. I found it impossible that anyone could have slept through that loud noise, but surprisingly, everyone was sound asleep. I flipped the hood of my jacket onto my head and begin walking towards the cabins. I can't explain it exactly, but there was this odd feeling I felt as I continued to walk, almost as if someone was behind me. I'm overreacting. No one else is out here, is what I say to myself in reassurance. The full moon casted a glare onto the reserve, so I could fairly see where I was going. The rain continued to drench my hoodie and my shoes as I carefully stepped between mud puddles. As I get to the cabin, I notice something jammed on the side of the entrance. Keep in mind that these cabins are made out of log. I used the force of my foot to knock the object loose, and after a few pushes, the body of a gray cat rolls out. It was dead. I was completely terrified. The only question I had in my head was, who or what would do something like that? It was too much going on at once. I still had to find Jessica, and the turbulence of this weather wasn't making it easy. I try the handle on the door and notice that it's locked, which is alarming because our chaperone usually left it open for campers to use the restroom in the hall. This just confused me even more as to where Jessica could be. Then, all of a sudden, I take note that the moonlight had completely disappeared. I hear this silent hither of some sort of animal or creature behind me. Whatever it was, I could tell it was a few feet away. My entire body felt ice cold as I faced the cabin door. There was no way I was turning around to see what the thing was. I start to hear footsteps move very slowly in the mud. It grunted in a low tone as it made its way towards me. I could tell this was not the presence of something small. It's time for me to make a move. I bang as loud as I can on the cabin, shouting for help in between knocks. 
A few moments later, my chaperone opens the door, yawning and squinting in confusion. I quickly move past her and close the door behind me. You're getting mud all over the floor, says Miss Kelly in agitation. After I catch my breath, I explain to her what was going on, or at least what I thought. Even after going into detail about everything, she responded in a laugh and groggily asked me did I need to use the bathroom. Well, that was clearly pointless. I take a few moments to get myself together and ask Miss Kelly to walk me back to my tent. She was irritated that I asked, but she agreed to do it anyway. She grabs an umbrella from a closet, and we head back. As I get to my tent and climb inside, I notice that Jessica is laying down. I tap her shoulder and ask her where she was. Apparently, she was in another tent the entire time with a classmate she had a crush on. Midway between us talking, I hear that same blood-curdling scream from earlier. We both sit up and stare at each other in astonishment. Jessica says, So you've heard it too? My heart drops to my stomach. Look, I know we joke a lot, but please just listen to what I'm about to tell you. I have a feeling that's not an animal out there. I explained. Jessica's face had skepticism written all over it. She whispers, You're not seriously suggesting that there's a ghost or something out there, are you? It's probably one of the girls playing around. You didn't feel what I felt out there, I say in conviction. When I was heading to the cabin, there was something behind me, and it didn't sound like a bear, a wolf, or a snake. That was something different. Shortly after, we continue to discuss what's going on. We decide to just head back to sleep until morning. Even with her hearing the noise herself, she refused to believe me. It made me question my own reality. Am I crazy? I woke up the next morning to the sound of distant voices talking in a frenzy. Jessica and I climb out of the tent and head to the bonfire a few feet up ahead. Mostly everyone, including our chaperone, was outside in a circle around the burning ember. Have a seat, guys, says Miss Kelly as she takes a deep sigh. I'm assuming you two have no clue where Michael and Kenny are, do you? Jessica and I look at each other in confusion. No, I haven't seen them. Uh, what exactly is going on? I respond in curiosity. Just an hour ago, I went to check on everybody before I began roll call. They weren't in their tents, and I have no idea what's going on. Listen, if this is a joke, guys, you gotta stop this. I have to. Suddenly, out of nowhere, Michael and Kenny stumble out of the woods and onto the ground in exhaustion. Their eyes were bloodshot red. We all rush over to console them both and ask what happened. They would say a few words, but it was mostly gibberish. Michael had no shirt on, and Kenny's white shirt was covered in dirt. They looked completely terrified. All right, this camping adventure is officially over. I don't get paid enough for this. Miss Kelly shouts in agitation. Please don't say I told you so, says Jessica as we walk back to our tent. When I wished for a memorable trip, this wasn't what I had in mind. Dusk. The salty water intermittently covers my feet. They sink slightly into the shore each time. The sounds of the ocean flood my ear canals. If I could see myself from a third-person perspective, I'd imagine my eyes would be rolling into my head before closing. At peace. In love with the ambience. Are there any sharks in that water, Mom? Sigh. No, son, that's a lake. Lakes contain fresh water. Sharks cannot swim in fresh water. I must have asked my mother that same question every single time we crossed the Mackinac Bridge. 
The bridge not only connects the upper and lower peninsulas of Michigan, but also creates the border from Lake Michigan to Lake Huron. All my little brain could think was there are monsters in dim dare waters. But my mother, bless her soul, not only maintained patience with me, but assured me every time that there were no sharks or any other monsters in the lake. Years later, now an adult, wiping my own butt and everything, I see a headline of an online article that makes me actually laugh out loud. Let me back up for just a moment, give you all some lovely context. I've traded the lake life for the salt life, almost 2,000 miles away from my childhood upbringing. I now live on the west coast. I get to wake up to 70 degree days in late December. The smells and sounds of the ocean surround me every day. A far cry from the frigid, below zero days, with only the cold as your greeter. I still keep up with my quote-unquote local news. I usually jump on the Detroit Free Press once a week. As such, I get recommended stories on my various feeds. That title I mentioned from earlier? Bull Shark, found in remote Michigan Lake. Well, well, well. What is this, Mom? After reading further, the article explains that although rare, there have been several bull shark sightings within the past two decades in the Great Lakes area. Apparently, bull sharks are so tenacious and adaptable that they can not only live in brackish water, but full-on freshwater. Rare, but not impossible. I wasn't laughing out loud anymore just quietly to myself. I don't think my mother was purposely keeping that information from me. I doubt she knew, or even cared. But I was vindicated. Sharks could have been in those lakes. One thought was staying with me, though. Adaptable. The will to not just live, but survive, is truly amazing. These sharks found their way out of water that transitioned from salt to fresh, and instead of dying, they fought. I took a pause. Grabbing my cold-brewed coffee, I looked out toward the ocean. The crashing waves always brought me peace, brought me back to reality. The ocean is known for being a dangerous place. That I never doubted. I never doubted that devilish creatures lived there. I never doubted that people could live. What is that? Squinting my eyes, I tried to focus on a cove that just barely is visible from where I live. Most days, you would have to use binoculars to see it. Today, the smog and weather had cooperated to allow me clear visibility. It must be over 10 miles away. There's something out there. A woman. No, stop it. Now that is not possible. It's not an island. Just a few rocks out in the cove. No one kayaked out there. It's much too dangerous. And there's nowhere to stop. You didn't just lay on the rocks out there. But I could see her. Red hair. White skin. That's really all I could see. She appeared to be sitting on the rock. Facing away from me, I could see long red hair cascading from her head down to the rock, maybe three or four feet long. Her arms, white and strong, were propping her body up, fingers spread. Her legs, those I couldn't see, until they came into view, moving up and down in front of her, just barely peeking from in front of her back. Her legs were not white like her arms. They were... green? No, dark. She must have been wearing pants. Maybe I should be calling the authorities. She has to be marooned out there. I threw my coffee into the sink and made my way to my cell phone. Before I could punch the first of three emergency numbers in, 
A cooing sound as sweet as a Sunday psalm was echoing in my head. There were no words, but I could hear the familiar melody of hallelujah being pounded out slow and mesmerizing. I dropped the phone. The phone smacking the wood floor snapped me out of my altered state. I looked at my computer, seeing the article about bull sharks somehow making their way into the Great Lakes. The beasts found their way into a place where they don't belong, seemingly to eat and survive, as they would in their natural habitat. It's not like you don't eat if you're on vacation, right? Even though you are not in your home, you still need to survive. Focused on sharks again, I sharply moved my neck towards the ocean. I completely forgot about the woman I just saw sitting out in the middle of the sea. The fog has crept in now. This doesn't make sense, but I think a few hours have passed. The horizon has subtly faded into the water. It was daylight when I saw her. Now dusk has appeared. Somehow, I can still see. I can see that she is gone. A huge sigh escapes me. A sigh my mother made every time I asked the stupid questions about sharks being in freshwater lakes. My sigh, though, was in relief. She was not there. Therefore, I had too much cold brew that was playing too many tricks on my overactive imagination. She looked real, though, even from miles away. I could see that blood-red hair, her arms propping her slight frame up, her scaly green legs flipping in front of her. Wait, what the heck? That did not happen, and I did not see that. She had legs. They were just in pants. A casual paddle boarder or kayaker that knew the rock was a safe place to take a break. I felt a pull. Something not of our physical world. A beckoning. This is just too much. I took one more look into the ocean, again confirming that there was nothing there and that nothing weird was happening. I looked again toward my computer, and it was turned off. Bzzz. I nearly tripped over my dining room chairs at the sound. My phone. I hadn't picked it up from the ground. I slowly extended my arm to pick up my face-down cellular device. As I lifted it up from the ground, I can already see the illumination reflect of the ground from its screen, indicating that I have a message. Wonder who it's from. Come outside. Those two words strike me through the collarbone like a harpoon. Holding the phone in my hand, I move my eyes from left to right, making carefully sure not to move my head. Something is here, watching me. Everyone knows the feeling. The sound of the ocean again brings me back to the real world. As real as it can get, I suppose. A cool breeze blankets me. I usually don't feel that this time of the year, as I keep all doors and windows closed because of the heat. I'd only get that ocean breeze if I opened. My sliding door leading to the porch is open. The wooden deck, damp, like someone just ran across it. Now I was upset, not wholly realizing that I had a likely intruder attempting to enter my home. I ran outside. Who are you? I yelled like that I was going to gain anything. Another strong wind hit my face. I turned to the side, struck by a scent that almost debilitated me. As I turned my eyes to my deck, a starfish looked back up at me. Another animal that can survive in rather harsh conditions. I scanned the horizon, now as dark as madness. 
The only light is coming from downtown, nearly five miles away. There's little in the way of streetlights in this area. Something about these lights being constructed in the 50s, and they still have not replaced them with newer LED styles. I can see one or two ships out there, peppered with safety lights, and then one more ball of white, where I saw her before. Somehow, I could see her clearly, even though she should be more than 16 kilometers away. Her hair was indeed red, just like her aura. Her green eyes pierced my soul. Her perfect teeth bared from behind her perfect flesh-colored lips. I realize that doesn't sound appetizing, but believe me, it is. She does not wear clothes, but she is covered by her hair. Amazing and regal. Her leg. Shh, calm yourself. Come be with me. You know you have so much missing, it's all out there. What? How? I can't get out there. I don't... I don't have a... What's it called? A thing that can transport me out there. Sally, I think you're trying to say a boat. It's okay. You don't need one. You will adapt. If you want something bad enough, you will survive. Why does that sound so familiar? How is there a woman out in the middle of the water? She must have gotten there for a reason. Maybe I'm supposed to be there. I have always loved the water. Fresh, salt, brackish, and everything in between. Her song is all but maintaining every last bit of space in my brain. It's so lovely. Not in charge of my motor skills anymore. My feet start moving me towards the shoreline. I should have done this a long time ago. Dusk. The salty water intermittently covers my feet. They sink slightly into the shore each time. The sounds of the ocean flood my ear canals. If I could see myself from a third-person perspective, I'd imagine my eyes would be rolling into my head before closing, at peace, in love with the ambience. I take my first step into the ocean. <laughs>